Me. We'll be discussing some of the economics and cost of vasodilating motor control. You're going to have to speak into here. Okay, sure. Yeah, because we're. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, both. Uh, good morning. It is uh, kind of right before lunch. Uh, you know, uh, even you're hungry, you know, you're awake. You know, uh, when you get, you know, big food, then you go to sleep. And you know, typically, the uh, it takes over. Uh, I guess about actions. Uh, so this is not a uh, bad time to talk about numbers. Uh, I have no pictures. Okay? It's all bar charts and uh, tables and things like that. So might put you to sleep. Uh, so this is not a bad time. Now I want to uh, be a, you know, give you a bit more in-depth uh, information back to you regarding the surveys. Uh, you know, Bill kind of you know, gave you uh, uh, the broad overview. Uh, you know, these surveys were completed uh, mostly in Florida last year. Uh, uh, I have data only from 13 surveys, and as you could see, uh, not 16, because many were empty in there. Uh, you know, I did get the surveys back. So uh, I really would like you to uh, complete the surveys in full when you get the surveys you know, today uh, before lunch. Uh, there were growers, distributors, seed companies, and all different uh, you know, uh, aspects of you know, growing basil uh, from around the country. And this was done uh, in 2014, but the uh, production was for the 2013 cycle. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll give you some backgrounds, and you might want to ask me, you know, why should I fill out the survey? Uh, as somebody was saying, you know, these chemicals, and we have so many of them. Still, we are doing trials. You know, it's not approved yet. Uh, if you know somehow, you know, we can act as a group. Uh, you know, we need a larger sample size. Uh, if we can act as a group and kind of you know document. There is uh, this you know, big you know, impact uh, because of the mildew, uh, size of the markets. Somehow you know, we can uh, you know, speed up the process of approval. Uh, you know, if you can take, take the document you know, back to the legislation, you know, they might be able to help you, you know, with the uh, uh, speeding up the approval process. Okay? Uh, who filled out the survey uh, last year? Uh, about 13 of which uh, male about 10, uh, female 3 uh, are the growers who filled out the survey. Uh, in terms of their uh, age group, who are they? Uh, mostly they ranged from uh, 51 to 65. Uh, there were some in the 36 to 50. And uh, there were some really young growers out there, uh, 21 to 35, uh, but not too many. But most of them were in 51 to 65. That's what you would expect. Uh, in terms of their education, just want to give you some backgrounds on who are those growers uh, in terms of their education. Uh, most of them did have an undergraduate degree. And as you could see, Many also had postgraduate degree, so you know you're talking about uh, you know very high level of you know, education. You know they know what they are dealing with, uh, so uh, they do have the background. In terms of you know uh, living, uh, they are living in the current location for about 14 years. Um, household size is about three, not too many children uh, in the household in terms of the you know grower backgrounds, and look at the the number of years of farming, 25 years. Okay, that's a lot of time farming. Uh, so you know, it just you know gives you some backgrounds uh, in terms of the uh, household income. As you could see, majority of them a uh, quarter million uh, plus, and of course there is uh, income uh, from the farming versus total income, uh, but majority of them are in the uh, quarter million range. You know, you're talking about you know, hundreds of acres, uh, so you know there is it is sizable. Okay, in terms of uh, operations, uh, I don't see the bottom here. Uh, it's missing, so I'm going to move on to the next one here. Uh, in terms of the neighborhood, uh, mostly they are, uh, this is suburban and the rural. The yellow is, was the urban, so mostly they are, in, that's what you would expect in a, you know, growing in the, uh, the fields, so it's basically they are from the suburban and the rural area. In terms of the acreage, I guess this is you know, one of the most important you know, questions that we'll be interested in. Um, on average, they were growing 200 acres of, uh, this is basil you're talking about, not just all the crops. Okay? Uh, of the respondents, you know, they were growing on average 200 acres per farm. And uh, the total acreage you know, of, the, of the total was 2006. Okay, among the 10, among the 10 we're talking about here. Uh, 
How many of them did the director seating? About 10, pretty much everybody did. So I guess they are doing a combination. So, so you know, uh, they are doing both direct seating and transfer planning of those who responded. Uh, you know, only one was doing the cuttings and most likely must be the uh, greenhouse grower. Just wanted to check with you, how many of you are a, a greenhouse grower? Okay, four or five, okay, good. Thank you. In terms of, you know, uh, uh, growing basil, uh, most of them raised, they are growing basil on a raised bed, about 70% of the 10 who uh, responded. I guess it's between 10 and 13. Uh, some grew on greenhouse, like a one-fourth, as you can see here, and uh, not too many on flat beds. Okay, so most are growing on raised beds. Uh, what kind of irrigation do they use? Most of them are using drip irrigation, uh, about 50%, and some do use furrow irrigation. Uh, very few are using overhead irrigation. Okay? This is what is being used by the respondents. In terms of uh, the cover and the uh, harvest, uh, as you could see, uh, most of them are bare ground growing, no cover. Okay, five and uh, 50, about 50% 50 use uh, plastic mulch. Okay, this is, you know, from you, so this is what you're using. Okay, this is a uh, strange question here. The average yield, uh, this is per farm growing 200 acres, okay? The yield is about 448,000 pounds. Okay, this is what I got back from you. But look at the uh, price received per pound, and that looks way too low to me. Uh, again, you know, I mean, when you fill out the numbers, you know, this is, you know, I mean, I, I just put in the numbers that I get back from you. So uh, uh, make sure, you know, you watch for those numbers because uh, uh, the range was from less than a dollar per pound okay, going up to about ten dollars a pound was the range. So this is what I get back, got back from you. Okay, so there is something uh, funny about that number. So we need to look into that very carefully. In terms of production cost for basil, uh, which you know you could imagine, majority of you thought that uh, it increased in the last five years, about you know 70 percent of them. Uh, so uh, I mean because you know down the mill you know it's going up, you know the cost of control is going up, uh, all the input costs are going up. So basically uh, that's why you would see uh, that you know there is increase in cost of production for for basil. Uh, in terms of you know, what contributed to the increased cost, uh, the top two items are post-harvest handling. Okay, someone asked about uh, post-harvest handling. Uh, that, you know, again, you know, because of all the uh, recalls with the, uh, uh, with the greens, uh, you know, uh, it is important that you, know, you do take care of the post-harvest in the proper way, also for the disease. And as you can see, those two are the uh, leading contributors for the increased cost of uh, production for basil. Okay? Of course, the others are there. Packaging is there, seed is there. Uh, fertilizer, also one of the uh, causes for increased uh, cost of production. Okay? Uh, out of the 13 uh, surveyed last time, 12 grew uh, uh, basil on, on an organic basis. Okay, So that is a Pretty much and everybody grew by organic. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, what is the uh, uh, mix now? How many of you uh, grow organically basil? Not too many, okay, compared to last year. I mean, last year pretty much everybody grew organically. Okay, it's a big difference. So, uh, you know, when we do these surveys, you know, we want to get the response from the majority of the, of, you know, of the respondents. That way, you know, uh, what we are talking here represents everyone in the field. Even we have a very small sample, and I can you know, put up the results, but you know, it means nothing. So the larger the sample is, it will represent you know, who you are. Uh, so hopefully we will get a better response rate uh, this time. Okay. Okay, in terms of the diseases, and what are the diseases? Now, as you would expect, uh, the number one among the growers is dummy milieu, okay? About 93% uh, said, you know, they had problems with dummy dum mildew. Okay, that's number one uh, uh, problem in terms of diseases. Uh, the number two is uh, Fusarium wilt, 87%. And number three is chilling injury, 
you saw the pictures earlier, okay? So those three are the uh, top most, you know, giving problems to growers, uh, of which uh, WD Mildy is number one. And that's why, you know, we are putting in so much time uh, right now, uh, you know, into uh, controlling uh, WD Mildy. Uh, what varieties are being used commonly uh, by the growers? Uh, as you can see, uh, Aroma 2 is the uh, number one. 30% okay, of those who responded uh, were using Aroma 2. And uh, Nufor is uh, number two. And uh, you can see the rest of the varieties, but those two are the uh, topmost varieties used by the, uh, by the growers who were uh, uh, attending uh, last year. Uh, okay, this is a very uh, important uh, slide here. Uh, look at the varieties, okay, and affected by downy mildew, and look at the yield loss, okay. Again, you know, this is a very partial data. I have an vision, I have more responses, but this is based on what I, what you, you know, what you gave me, okay. Look at uh, Nufer number five, okay, Nufer. The, uh, the yield loss is 77% because of downy mildew. Okay? Uh, again, you know, I'm sure you know, they must have controlled to some extent. You know, this is not a, uh, basically with no control, I'm sure you know, they are using what they can, but they had 77% yield loss with the nufer. Okay? And maybe you know, some varieties are you know, more uh, susceptible to downy mildew with a higher yield loss than the others. Uh, but look at the Italian, only 20% needle loss, uh, and then Aroma 2 was, a, was with 60% needle loss, okay? But you know, you're talking about here, look at the frequency, one, it was one person, okay? So I can't generalize based on one person. You know, the more frequency I have, you know, then you have better confidence in the, in the numbers, okay? So I want more responses that I can give it back to you. Okay, so uh, this is basically a preliminary, you know, survey results. So hopefully when we do the main survey, uh, you know, you will have more responses that I can give it back to you. Uh, when it comes to Fusarium wilt, as you can see, uh, affected by Fusarium wilt, yes or no. Uh, Italian, Artin, Aroma 2, uh, there was no uh, incidence among the growers who responded uh, because they said no. In the case of uh, long fetal, uh, Nufor, uh, there are some said who said yes, some said no. Okay, so it's a combination. Uh, again, you know, I mean, frequency is very low, so I don't know whether we can generalize based on uh, you know, these, these tables. You know, I want to see you know, more, uh, more responses. Okay, in terms of uh, pests and insect, uh, you know, uh, affecting the uh, sweet basil. You can see in all ranges, uh, white flies uh, are a, a major problem. Equally, uh, spider mites are the top two problems. But even others like the aphids, problems, caterpillars, uh, threps, and you, know, you can see, you know, uh, I mean, we have everything in there. Uh, but the top two are the white flies and the spider mite, okay, in terms of an insect uh, attack on, on basil. Okay, most, you know, we talk so much about the control, you know, uh, and you know, how we are supposed to control, uh, which one is more effective. Of course, you know, some are still not registered yet because you know, it's still in the trial stage, okay? They're not available in the market. But, you know, what are you using to control? Uh, uh, this is insecticides, basically, right? So, uh, which is used most commonly? Uh, Pygenic is used by most respondents to control insects. Uh, others are interest, uh, depot are being used, and the uh, telone is another an insect that is used, commonly used by, by, the, by the growers. Okay, so others are nice, you could see. Okay, uh, let's talk about the uh, organic fungicides uh, for basil, you know, what you used you know, from, the, from last year. Um, oxidate is uh, number one, and that's what we talked about earlier, okay, by, by the, the, in the treatments there, okay. Uh, mostly, uh, you know, growers use oxidate, and number two is 
Serenara mix. I don't know what that is. Uh, you know, probably you, know, you do. So uh, being used by the growers, and then Actinovate AG. They're used by you to control uh, 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 fungicides. That's just a fungicide. Okay. So these are the uh, most commonly used fungicides by you. In terms of the uh, conventional fungicides, you know, used for sweet basil, uh, we talked about uh, Ranman quite a bit, then used by you. Uh, but the most common was quadrus among the uh, 13 growers. This is what they used to control uh, conventionally uh, for the basil. Okay, uh, K fight. We talked quite a bit about K fight, but used only you know by almost like one person out of uh, 13. Okay. Uh, this is what being used in the field. Uh, if we have you know, more responses, then it will be more representative. So hopefully, you know, when we when I get back to you next time, uh, you know, I, I, it will be more reflective of you know what you do in the field. Okay. Uh, K fight. Uh, all basically all you know, uh, uh, phosphorus based uh, uh, fungicides. You know, is, is, you know, as you can see. Uh, reverse, we talked about reverse quite a bit, right? So uh, look at that, you know, not too many people use reverse. Uh, so this is in what you're used in the field. Okay, in terms of, you know, what kind of sprayers you used to control, uh, to spray, um, pretty much everybody used uh, the boom spray that, uh, you know, Meg mentioned, okay? Nine out of 13. Uh, some used air assisted sprays and back sprayers quite commonly used in a 6 out of 13 by you, okay, to control uh, use fungicides. In terms of, you know, processing, uh, you know, this, we're talking about post-harvest now, uh, basil. Out of uh, 13, you know, not too many responded to the question, but four of them said they do uh, process basil, uh, post-harvest handling, and only one said no. In terms of you know, what kinds of processing they do, uh, sorting, grading, cooling, packaging uh, is not kind of typically they do. So everything is, as you can see, again, the frequency is so low because uh, uh, not too many respondents to the survey. Okay, it was a long survey. Yes, it was a 10-page survey, uh, but I didn't, uh, we did cut that down to now five pages, and I will talk about that in a bit later. Now, where do you take this basil uh, for marketing? And as you could see, most of them take them to supermarkets. Linkage, you know, once you uh, uh, do the uh, uh, post harvest, you pack them for retail uh, direct selling, and that's where most of the uh, basils go to the supermarkets. Uh, about 50 percent, and uh, many of them do contract farming, and that's really uh, I'm kind of surprised. Kind of, you just grow it and kind of give it back to somebody else to do all the work. Anybody doing contract farming? None. Yeah, that's what I thought. I mean, this is a uh, one. Okay, good. Um, one third did contract farming in the last year, so uh, a lot of changes here. Okay, okay more of sale. Uh, most of them sell individually, uh, you know, directly to those supermarkets. Six out of uh, ten who responded, uh, one by group through group, one cooperative, uh, one contract. Okay, so all combinations you could see, but mostly individuals, you know, which you would expect. The okay, main trading partners, uh, you know, which are related questions, uh, typically they are dealing with retailers directly, which means you, know, you are doing a lot of post harvest. You are packing individually uh, to directly go to the retailers. Uh, when you have high volume, of course, you would go through wholesalers. Uh, about 30% of the uh, respondents did go through wholesalers, but majority of them, uh, you know, go to the uh, retailers directly. I mean, that's where the money is. Uh, if you have a high volume, but then uh, it's going to take a lot of your time to go directly to the retailers. Uh, where are they getting their uh, training from? Uh, as you could see, uh, half of those who responded are getting training. Uh, about, about six out of uh, 13 said they're not getting any training from the uh, uh, Ag Extension Services. Uh, what kinds of training did they receive? Okay, we have categorized them into different categories. As you could see, uh, look at the yes column, the last column there, uh, the number five. Look at uh, the row four, 
frequency is five. Okay, disease and pest control. That's where they're getting the training for. Okay, that shows that is the main problem. Dumbly Mildy, basically, you're talking about, you know, is one of them. So many of them are getting training to control uh, diseases and pests. Okay, other trainings they're getting into management technologies, varieties, uh, seed production methods, as you could see. Uh, business management, three. Okay, so it's basically you know, what you are, you know, trainings you're, you're getting. Okay, uh, bring it back to you. Was the training useful? Uh, many did say it was pretty useful. Uh, especially uh, varieties, uh, disease control, management technologies. <coughs> but on the uh, marketing side in conservation farming, some said no, not that useful. Okay, so we just have to find a way to uh, make these trainings more useful in those categories. Whether applied, uh, ever applied the technology that you learned during the training. And uh, many of them did say they did you know, apply the technology that they learned during the training. Okay, in many of the categories, uh, pretty much you know, like disease control, varieties, management techniques, uh, you know, they did use the uh, knowledge they learned in the field. Okay, this is again the response you know, from, from you. Uh, source of the uh, training information visited by government agents, extension agents, local administrative and research organizations. Okay. Uh, many, as you could see, either uh, visited by the uh, government or extension agent or local administrative meetings. Those two are the, uh, the, the main categories you know, from where you are getting your, tra your information from, trainings from. Okay, not from uh, the research organizations. Okay, that's what you said. Uh, other uh, places, uh, getting the uh, training information from NGOs, not too many from NGOs, some from field days and demonstration plots. Okay, a uh, few there, and most are coming from others. You know, I don't know, you know maybe workshops, I'm not sure, uh, but that's where they are getting their training and information for information from. A crop insurance. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, as you could see, uh, out of 11, almost 50% had crop insurance for basin. Okay, but six had no crop insurance. You know, this is I don't know whether, you know, how big an impact it has, how much has it cost. I have no idea. I was wondering you know, how many of you have uh, crop insurance for basin, the group here. Anybody crop insurance? No, none. Okay, so uh, those who came last year, you know, five had. Uh, crop insurance. Okay, so I don't know what, what it means. Something you might look into. Uh, you know, if you do have, you know, 70% crop loss, you know, this is something to look into. I don't know. I mean, it's a uh, something to try. Okay, in terms of an obstacles for uh, expanding production, what is it? Okay, look at the number one. Diseases. Okay, ten. Pretty much everybody for expansion. Okay. That shows the effect of dummy mildew. Okay, everybody has a problem. Uh, in fact, you know, somebody was you know, telling me yesterday anecdotally. You know, somebody was telling me uh, they owned a uh, like a 300-acre basil farm. Okay, uh, a few years ago. Now, nothing because of dummy mildew. They just couldn't control. Okay, so that is a big problem. Okay. And other things, uh, insects. As you can see, you know, the list is not that big compared. Competition, okay, that's always there, right? Okay, I mean that is uh, basically I'll just give you a background in terms of you know what I got back from you preliminary survey. Not too many respondents. Uh, from a ten-page survey, now we have come down to a five-page survey. Okay, um, you will. You will get a copy of the survey when you leave uh, this room uh, before the lunch. It looks you know, something like this. It is a five-page survey right now. Uh, but if you look at the last two pages, okay, the last two pages are the uh, cost of production budgets. Okay, we put them in two formats. Uh, one of them, uh, first one is for uh, large-scale uh, growers when you have a large farm. So everything is on a per acre basis. What is your cost per acre? 
for uh, seeds, you know, for cover crop, you know, for uh, fertili fertilizer, uh, everything on a per acre basis. Okay, so if you are a, a large grower, uh, fill out only this section of the uh, budgets, not the second page. Fill out the, uh, the rest of the five pages and then only the, uh, the one that talks about per acre basis. But if you're a small grower, okay, I was told, uh, especially in, in the Long Island area, uh, many of them are growing in a very small scale basis, not even an acre. Uh, so uh, we designed another uh, budget page for a, a small scale grower, okay, who are growing less than an acre of, of, of basil, okay. So this is based on per bed. What is the cost per bed for the seeds, you know, for the fertilizer, everything else on a per bed basis. Uh, the size of the bed is 65 by 6. That's what we used. Uh, I know, uh, uh, you know these numbers are based on some uh, work in Iowa. And you know, they, they don't grow that many basil in, in Iowa. So we, uh, we kind of you know, uh, transformed the numbers for the East Coast, changed the bed size for the East Coast. So uh, what you see here is what is typically is the expense if you grow on a per acre basis that is there already. Okay? And the column next to that is the place in a way you want to put in your numbers. What is the your number on a per acre basis? And what is the your number on a per bed basis? So you do only one of these two tables, not both. Okay? So uh, I will be you know, during the lunch and I'll be there. So if you have any questions, you know, let me know. And we can talk more about it. Uh, to give you a little bit more uh, info about the survey, I just put them on the uh, slides right here. Okay, looks very similar. Uh, capturing you know what varieties you grow, what is the acreage, uh, what is the harvest, and things like that. Uh, it is up to you. You know if you want to give your phone number. You know if you want to go back and you know uh, give me more information, and I can call you back. Uh, it, it's, it's up to you. Okay, if you want to leave a, a contact number, you know, we can contact you. Uh, if you have any questions. But again, you know, when we publish the results, okay, everything is only uh, aggregate numbers. No individual numbers will be published, no names, nothing, okay, when it comes out. Yes, you saw you know, how we presented, okay, so everything is confidential. Nothing, no names will be sent out. Uh, many questions are uh, multiple choice questions, as you could see. Check the boxes, very easy, not too difficult. Uh, only some sections are in a very in-depth because, I mean, you want to see these numbers. You want to know these numbers by variety, okay? Uh, whether uh, seedlings uh, transplanted, uh, what type of irrigation you, know, you used, uh, the cover you used, harvest yields, the prices, and these are the things you know, that you, know, you want to see report back, you know, back to you. That's why you put them out there. Now, these could be a bit complicated. You now, take the time to fill out these you know, uh, tables. Any questions, you know, let me know, and I'll be glad to explain to you during lunch here. Okay. Uh, like I said, you know, these are in two different uh, 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 formats. One is for the uh, large-scale farmers on a per-acre basis, 70 bits per acre. I'm not sure. You know, this is what I was told. You know, typically, you grow 70 bits per acre. Uh, the size of the bed, 65 by 6, when you grow large-scale. And it looks like this. Okay, how much do you harvest in an acre? Uh, I was told it's about 1,700 pounds is how much you harvest per acre. Typically, you get about you know ten dollars a uh, pound. Your revenue is about seventeen thousand uh, dollars per acre. Okay, uh, this is on average, and I mean you could be getting higher or lower. I'm not sure. Uh, this is again based on numbers uh, that were given to me from some growers. Uh, you could see. What is the uh, typical input supplies on a per acre basis? Uh, seed uh, cover crop, 49 pounds, seed, 70 packets, everything, and again, based on you know, some responses I got from you. And your quantity is empty, and that's what you have, you have to fill out. Those columns that are empty, you have to fill out. Okay, this is on a per acre basis for large uh, growers. Labor, again, filled out for a typical grower, and you fill out your number. Okay, you can compare 
you know, how, you know, how is you know, your expense compared to a typical person as a large grower? Okay. Likewise, uh, harvest. Okay, how much you are harvesting, uh, the labor cost of harvesting, packaging cost and everything put together. Okay, your number versus uh, came from others is right there. We can compare. Okay, variable cost, uh, again, uh, we have listed that, you know, what is the uh, total variable cost? About $5,000 is the variable cost on a per acre basis is what you're spending uh, to, uh, it's basically the cost of production or to cultivate basil. Ultimately, uh, uh, what is the return per acre? Total is about uh, $12,000 per acre of basil on average. And uh, you have to put any your numbers on in the last column there. Okay, that way I can uh, put them together again and bring it back to you. What is your number? Okay. Uh, so I said that there are two kind of you know, templates. Uh, you just saw the for the large scale farmer uh, on a per acre basis. Now it is on a per bed basis. Okay, uh, these numbers are you know how much uh, uh, sales in a bed you get about 25 pounds. You know the numbers and will match uh, on a per acre basis. So uh, if you are a small scale grower, fill out only per bed basis template, not the per acre. Okay. So likewise, now just go through the same thing, pretty much that's what I have. Uh, this is what is you know, being done in general. What is your quantity, what is your cost in total, as I'm looking at, okay? So once I have those, hopefully I will report them back to you in a, in a report form, and if you have another meeting, and I could come back and talk to you, or otherwise, and I can send you the report itself once we compile all the, all the responses. Okay. Labor, uh, similarly, on a per bit basis, okay? Uh, harvest, similarly, and then you have the variable cost in there, and here comes the uh, returns on a per bed basis, uh, per bed, but you get about $160 per bed, is what you get back as the net return. Okay. More questions, and basically they are all uh, multiple choice questions, and I can read through, nothing complicated, okay, diseases and things like that. Uh, but I do want you know, more details on the fusarium belt. You know, how do you control yield loss? You know, this, you know, this is a very important part of the survey. Uh, so whatever you, you know, give me is going to come back to you. Okay, so make sure you, know, you take the time to uh, you know, fill out and as much as you can. Uh, you know, I know it is you know, complicated. It is a painful you know, process to go through. Uh, but you know, this is you know, uh, unless you give me the numbers and I can give it back to you. Same thing down the mildew, and same on uh, chilling injury. Okay, if you have any data, uh, fill those up. Okay, rest of them are uh, what kind of chemicals are being used. The whole list is there. I worked with uh, Andy and others in the gym to put down the list. Uh, so pretty much, and everything should be there. Okay, fungicides. The whole list is there. Just tick off and you know, whatever you think you, know, you are using. Uh, Someone talked about uh, value addition, basically post-harvest, okay? How do you uh, do post-harvest, what do you do? So you know, everything is here. So take the time to fill out you know, what kind of post-harvest you do. Uh, the, the more responses I get, you know, it will be more representative. And you know, everything is there. Uh, do you process yes or no? What kind are listed down there, uh, read through? Uh, you know, these things are not that complicated to fill out. Um, Memory, you know, these things, and you will remember, I'm sure, uh, you know, what you do. Uh, unlike, you know, quantity of pesticides that you use, you know, that could be complicated. But this, these sections are pretty easy to fill out. Okay, in terms of the extension needs, you know, if you need, specifically, if you have any needs, you know, fill these out. Uh, you know, when we have the trainings, you know, we will make sure that, you know, we give you these trainings back to you. Uh, again, you know, again, this is, this is, you know, your needs. Okay, nothing complicated there. Uh, crop insurance I talked about earlier. Uh, some of the demographics, okay, uh, which I presented earlier. Fill these out, you know, it comes to you only as a uh, cumulative number, uh, nothing uh, specific per person, okay. Likewise, uh, income of those farms and things like that. Okay, everything is there, okay. Okay, this is something I wanted to show you. This is the last slide. I'm pretty much done uh, with, with my talk here. Uh, when you go and look at basil online, 
Okay? I spent quite a bit of time. I cannot find a single document that talks about what is the value of you know, basal production in the US. It doesn't exist out there. Okay? What is the production? What is the value? You know, I don't see it. Okay? If you know, you know, let me, if you know, you know any document, let me know because you know, if you want to act as a group, okay, if you want to go to the legislation, okay, you must be able to show, you know, this is the value from a document. Something, you know, uh, more official from the survey or you know whatever it is. Okay? This is the only you know thing that I could find. This is a uh, based on HDS code and this is imported in coming into the US. So this is the only thing I could find. Okay? Uh, this is not the latest number, you know we do have the November number but this gives you some ideas. Okay? Um, the basal fresh or dried, whether or not uh, cut or crushed, powdered, imported coming into the US. Okay? Look at the uh, value. Okay, coming in uh, right now at about uh, 3.5 million dollars coming into the U.S. Where are they coming from? Number one is Mexico, 1.9 million. Okay, uh, all combinations in you know, fresh and uh, dried. Okay, number two is coming from Egypt. Okay, that's 800 million dollars. It's a lot of money coming in from Egypt. Uh, dried products, I'm not sure in what they are. Okay. But this is the only document I could find. Look at the month of uh, June and July. Okay, it's going down. Why? Because you know you have fresh basil here in the country. So every year, the imports go down in June. Okay, that's where the volume hits you know, from the local production. And by Jan, February, and March, the production is low unless you're growing in the uh, greenhouse. Okay, once the field production and it gets cut off, the imports come in. So that shows you know there is demand for the basil. They are still importing basil. Okay? So uh, hopefully, you know, uh, with the techniques, you know, we can grow them better uh, in the greenhouse and uh, supply to those who are in need uh, and, you know, uh, with, the, with the local production then, you know, importing uh, basil from uh, Colombia and Peru and other places. That's right. Okay? So that's pretty much what I have. And thank you.